But without any further ado, would y'all give a 1030 rowdy welcome to my friend, Isaac <laughs> Witty. Let's go. Hey, buddy. Hi. Hi, everybody. How's it? Ready for some Sunday morning comedy? <laughs> All right. All right. You guys are like, did Bernie Sanders and Larry David have a baby? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe. I look like Prince William after a three-day bender. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, bald. I don't know if you guys know that about me or not. I'm a bald guy. I'm sorry. Actually, I say balding, huh? I like to say balding, and it, sound, it sounds more productive. <laughs> it's like I'm always up to something. I'm busy. Lo looks like I'm doing one thing right now, but uh uh, multitasking. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't like to say I've lost my hair, right? That, that makes it sound like, had I been more responsible, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah, I was like, where's your hair? <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. <laughs> uh, let me give you guys a tip. Uh, if you ever go to the Middle East, uh, Israel, Egypt, any place like that, don't make the mistake I did. Don't use those maps in the back of your Bible to get around. <laughs> those are way out of date. And those lines on there say like, you know, path of Paul, path of Jesus, those are not roads. <laughs> this, this is my favorite thing to do when I fly. I don't talk to the person I'm sitting next to the entire flight. And then as soon as we touch down, I say, can I have a ride home? <laughs> I like to do that. I, was, I just started working out. That's what's new with me. And it's not working out. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not that I hate working out. I just hate my gym, right? Because my gym has great big windows everywhere, right? And every time I'm on the treadmill, I'm forced to see all the people outside walking for free. <laughs> <laughs> I used to jog. I quit jogging because I got tired of people asking if I'm okay. <laughs> I like to listen to sports talk radio when I go to the to the, <laughs> to the, uh, to the gym. Right? I forgot my earbuds the other day, right? I was all bummed out because I couldn't find my earbuds, right? So I was like, ah, I'll have to work, work out with nothing, right? So I'm in the locker room. I'm pulling out yesterday's workout clothes, and hey, ha-ha-ha, <laughs> I'll plops my earbuds. I didn't know they were in my bag, right? So it was when, when I was in the gym, I saw them at the floor, and I got excited. I go, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Right, but I said it <laughs> just as that guy's towel dropped. <laughs> right, what do you do then? You can't explain yourself. <laughs> you can't be like, ah, not you, naked guy right there. <laughs> that I'm looking at, explain the situation to. Smoothing things over, <laughs> that make it worse, right? Here's what I did. I overemphasized this. I was like, yay! <laughs> this is exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> I was a homeschool kid. Anybody else homeschooled? Just me, perfect. <laughs> It was brief for me. I, I went back to public school. I decided that I liked public school more because in public school, when you get the answer wrong, the teacher doesn't cry because her son is stupid. <laughs> I'm not very smart. I'm not. Like, I, I've been known to lose Connect four in four moves. <laughs> like, mm, straight up and down. I see your tactic. <laughs> see, I had my thing going on over here. One more move and you'd have been dead. <laughs> Not all my jokes have real climactic endings to them. Some of them start here and they go here and they teeter off. They're built that way. They're like <laughs> stocks that you should have sold earlier. <laughs> Weird reaction, okay. My mom always tried to make birthday special for me when I was a kid. Like one year, she put a life-size inflatable clown in my room. Yeah, to be neat when I woke up. Now, let me just tell you guys that <laughs> you don't know fear. 
till you wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. And there in the darkness is what appears to be man in a clown outfit. Watching you while you sleep. Right, my knees buckle immediately, like out of fear. What made even more scary is that he didn't even move. <laughs> he just stayed focused. You know. He was like, happy birthday. Oh. I was always afraid when I was a kid, I was afraid somebody was under my bed. And if I got up, he'd like grab my ankle. Right? And that was very scary at the time. But see, that's the great thing about getting older, isn't it, right? Because like, now that I'm older, I realize that's just not enough payoff for a psycho. It's <laughs> a lot of work, right? You gotta like drive all the way out to my house, find a parking place, walk up to my house, <laughs> get in, get into my room, get out of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a long time. <laughs> like all that in hopes that maybe you can <laughs> grab that sweet ankle of mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. And the weird part is at this point, I was not even afraid that he would then kill me. I wasn't. I was just afraid he didn't grab my ankle. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> like politely excuse himself. Right. <laughs> I gotta go. I snuck in, but I'm going out the front this time. Better lock up. There's some crazy people out there. Now, one time when I lived in Minneapolis, I wanted to get like a job job over the summer, right? So I heard about this job at the Mall of America, right? Like here's the job. Kids are not allowed to be at the Mall of America without an adult, right? So there's a job where someone, they walk around the mall, they ID kids. If they're underage, you take them home, they get sent home. I don't know how they get home, whatever. <laughs> I just wanted a job, right? So. So I called the HR department at the Mall of America and I got the voicemail and I got all tongue tied. And that's why I said, I go, hi, my name is Isaac Whitty and I'm interested in that job where you walk around the mall and find kids and <laughs> take them home. <laughs> right, that's not what I meant to say at all. Like, that's just what came out, right? But I, I was thinking in the process, I sounded even creepier when I tried to correct myself. I was like, uh, I don't want kids at my house. <laughs> so give me a call. <laughs> hey, guys, that's my time. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> All right. Come on, I'm <laughs> That was good. So if, uh, if you want to hear more, Isaac, this is really cool. Coming up in October, you're coming the back. first Friday of next month, the 7th, yes. Okay, October yep. 7th, you're going to yep. be here. Some more comedians right here at LifePoint. Yeah, so come, come on back. back. It's going to be really cool. Uh, yeah, there might be some information. You can follow us and hear more about that. Um, but thanks for being with us today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so like I mentioned a, a moment ago, this is kind of comedy with a purpose. This is going to kind of point to something really big towards uh, the end here. And you have a really amazing story of, of grace. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I know you just said you're homeschooled. Right. What was your family like growing up? Well, I was, I was raised in church, to say the least. Like, my parents were in the ministry growing up. Like, my parents were the grandparents of Christian comedy. Like, they started in the late 70s. Like, they, wow. they would go into churches, and they would, like, have to talk the pastor into moving the pulpit for the first time in 50 years, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I would be the kid that would watch my parents do comedy all the time. They were in the ministry. Ministry and I would watch him and loved the idea of one day doing being a comedian myself. Uh, my dad became a pastor. I was a pastor's kid. Like church in the eighties is not like today. Like you didn't just go one time a week. It was like Wednesday <laughs> yeah. night, Sunday morning, yes. Sunday night. <laughs> you, like, it was, you lived there. I lived at church yeah. and it was, I was always there. Yeah. So then my parents, they became minor league 
Christian world celebrities on a show called The Gospel Bill Show and Fire by Night. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but yeah. it was in the three 90s. People, three, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. See, huge stars, I told yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. So you grew up in church, around church. Yes. You were over-churched. But am I understanding, Jesus never really made an impact on your life. No, it, it, really, I as a kid, seeing the ministry from the angle I did, I, I saw the business side of it okay. because my, I saw that's what my dad did for a living. And that's, uh, it never did really hit my heart or my, it really didn't mean much to me. I was weirded out by the Bible. I was weirded out by praise and worship. I remember being just weirded out by a lot of things that yeah. people, other people seem to be so heavily influenced by. And uh, that was kind of a secret of mine as a kid. It never did really hit me that hard. Never really hit you. No. So you, um, you get into comedy. How, how do you break into that specific world? Now, this isn't a, really a question for us. It's more for Pastor Chris, because he's been trying to do it for five years. <laughs> So just laser in on uh, Pastor Chris, but no, really, how do you get into comedy? Well, see, when I was 20 years old, I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, I'd always, growing up, I'd always been really into, like, in the, 80, in the 90s, there were, like, Evening of the Improv was on TV every night of the week. There were all these stand-up shows, and I just idolized these comedians. I would tape them and watch them and re-watch them over and over and over again. Uh, when I was 20 years old, a comedy club opened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I, I auditioned for, I went to open mics, and I became one of the four house MCs at this club. Hmm. And which means I was the MC once every month for a week. And which meant, really, it was amazing for me at the time because I was this 20-year-old kid getting to work with some of the people that I had watched as a kid over and over again on TV. So I was just, I idolized these people I worked with. But yeah, over, over the course of three years, I was in Tulsa. And uh, then I up and moved to Minneapolis. And that's where things really start taking off. I mean, like right. it became your full-time job now. Right. After I moved to Minneapolis, I, I was able to get on stage like five. So I could get on stage every night of the week if I wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, comedy really started to take off. And also, uh, like when I, if I was not a real Christian in Tulsa, I became a blatant non-Christian in Minneapolis. Like yeah. I left everything involving God behind. Like it just, and I was happy to do it. I really, yeah. I, I looked at, I looked, I looked at it as very liberating to be able to be away from church people and wow. I could uh, be who I really was, you know, be yeah. the real me. Um, but hmm. even though I wasn't living right, my career, I just kept, it was a magical time in my life, really. Like, I, I, I got to the point where I had management. I was living on the road. I would just work different comedy clubs every, every uh, week of the year and um, got further and further into drinking and partying. You know? So that's really where it started. Yeah. Breaking free from Tulsa. You're not playing Christian anymore. You're, you're, you're just living your life. Yeah. So you get a phone call, and my understanding is if you're a comedian, this is the call back, especially in the 90s, <laughs> early 2000s. Early David 2000s, yeah. Letterman. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, the show called you back, and you got a spot on the David Letterman show, which is like the mecca. So right. what was it like meeting David Letterman? Well, I, uh, when I did Letterman, um, it was a guest host. It was, oh. it was, I know it was Tom Green. No, Tom Green. <laughs> right, I know. It could have been worse, though. <laughs> could have been Stephen Colbert. Uh. <laughs> I'll let See? that one die. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I, I, get, uh, I did that show, and that was like, that's where I really, um, it was very affirming at the time. I went from doing clubs all the time to doing to headlining clubs which meaning I was the last of the three guys and I also got a college agent I was making money for the first time um, and that was around the time when I did a comedy club called the comic strip in El Paso Texas hmm. and uh, when I was in El Paso I remember there was a night when the staff had told us hey, let's go over to Juarez. This was back in the days when you could actually do that. You, you just walk across. You just walk across to hang out, and you didn't even get murdered or anything. Wow. <laughs> those, were the, those were the days. Yeah, oh, boy. Those were the days. <laughs> but I remember I was in Juarez, and we were sitting at a bar, and I remember my friend turns to me, 
And he said, it's just a real example of how sin can creep into your life and it seems like absolutely nothing at the time. But he turned to me that night and he goes, he was talking to somebody and he turns to me and he goes, hey, do you want to try cocaine? And, and I was like, the way I justified it was, well, I'm in Mexico, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm I, not in America. Right. Therefore, it kind of doesn't count. Huh. And I, that was the, my first line of cocaine wow. in Juarez, Mexico. And it was like, it felt like I wasn't doing anything big at the time. But really, that was like signing on the dotted line, mm. like beginning a 15-year love affair with cocaine. Mm. I did. I, I was. It's funny how like with sin... You can you look at you look at it as I'm doing what I really want to do, therefore I'm free. But really, once you give in to something like what I did, you become a complete slave to it. Wow. You know, and like I, 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 I centered my life around it. Yeah. Because I had to. Well, let's stay there for a second. Um, this word addiction, you know, you think about the power and the grip, a great word, the grip that addiction can have on anybody's yeah. life, no matter what the addiction is. Uh, talk a little bit about that grip that it had on you and your identity. Right. Well, it's, it doesn't stop. It just keeps getting worse and worse. It actually, it reminds me of, um, it reminds me of one of my favorite stories in the Bible, in the New Testament, is of, of when Jesus confronts the demon-possessed man, who says his name, he asks him what his name is, and the man responds, my name is Legion, for we are many, right? Which really, the demons are, are speaking through him. He doesn't even have his own voice anymore. This is a man who has completely lost his identity. Mm. And that's what addiction does. I di addiction, no matter what it is you're addicted to, it robs you of your identity. It steals that from you. Mm. And Jesus offers offers freedom and redemption from that. And what I love about that story is when Jesus does free the man of, and he sends the demons into the pigs, right? That's when the guy's like, let me follow you. And Jesus is like, I need you to go. Yeah. Go tell people what happened here today. And that, that's, that's, I feel like, the call of my life. And I feel like all calls on every believer's life yeah. is to go and tell your story. You know? So that's powerful, though. I mean, I don't want us to just skip past that. Addiction robbed your identity. It, 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 it felt like it just took your life. Right. Something that started off so innocent grew to this massive thing. You know, this word addiction, um, it literally means to be nailed to, uh, to enslave. Right. What, what an accurate description of the word. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 16 actually talks about this. That's what, what I love about the Bible. Paul says this. He says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? So you can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. In other words, Paul's like, listen, everybody is addicted to something. Just let that hit. Everybody's addicted to something. And sure, your addiction might not be as outward as drugs or alcohol. Maybe it is, but you might be addicted to shopping. You might be addicted to pornography, people pleasing. Maybe there's this constant need for approval, that a boy, that a girl, and that's where you find your worth. Right. And, and, and we get nailed to that. And of course, for you, it was, it was drugs, it was alcohol, it robbed you of your identity. So I know there's a turning point. This is what I want to get to. Um, you had this really great opportunity. Now, you're not going to name drop, so I'll do it for you. But your, your friend, Amy Schumer, invited you to come out to the Target Center where the Timberwolves played to open for her. Right. Like 10,000 people. What was that like? Well, see, back when, back when I was... When I lived in New York back in the, uh, like uh, around 2004, I became friends with someone who eventually became a, a household name. Yeah. And it, at the time, there was a time when I was really good friends with her. And um, she, she, I saw in the paper that she was gonna be coming to Minneapolis. So I texted her like, hey, we should hang out. And then she said, do you wanna open for me? And I was like, absolutely. Now you gotta keep in mind this time I was, I was a wreck, right? I was, I was a cokehead. I was, uh, I was living in bars all the time. I had a restaurant job and I was doing comedy too. But, but I had in my head at the time, like my life is a mess, right? But I can always pull it together when I get on stage. I can always kill when I get on stage, wherever it is. I, I wore that as a badge of honor that how bad my life is over here, but it doesn't matter because of how good it is over here. But Boy, that night, that, that night when I opened for, for Amy Schumer at, at Target Center in front of 10,000 people, it 
ruined me <laughs> because I, I, as the opener that night, I bombed. I don't know. Was, imagine the feeling of bombing in front of 10,000 wow. people. I'm pretty sure I got... I got five minutes into my 15 minute set before I just bailed. Wow. And I was, I, I, got, I think I got, I got paid $3,000 for those five minutes. Yeah. It pays pretty well to bomb. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, but it was crushing blow to me because I, at that point, I was like, well, now I'm not even really a comedian. I'm not even someone that can pull it together when I get on stage. And that's when I fully, just fully started to identify myself, I'm just an addict now, and that's wow. all I am, and that's all I'll ever be. So this is obviously a very low moment, very dark moment. Rock yeah. bottom might be some language that you'll hear in recovery circles. What is, was this rock bottom? I mean, what was next? Almost, it was almost rock bottom. Okay. I started selling furniture. Uh, <laughs> Right. You're not kidding. I'm not joking. No, yeah. I had given up on being a, wow. com a comedian, so I <laughs> I got a job selling furniture, and I was. It's a natural progression. Absolutely, yeah. yeah that's what you do. You do this, and this. But I I did that, and I was super into Adderall. I, uh, if you, and if you don't know what Adderall is, Adderall is a drug that makes you really excited about selling sofas. <laughs> yeah. It's intense. Yeah, I can yeah. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I, I was popping about 90 milligrams a shift when I would be working mm. at, uh, at a furniture store in Minneapolis. And one day, I could not find any Adderall, but I could find meth, mm. right? It's a lot easier to find meth than Adderall sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just kind of, again, I like the Mexico thing, I kind of justified, well, it's generally the same thing. It'll just be this once. And that began a two-year even further decline into, wow. into meth and pornography. And I, uh, yeah, it, yeah. I was a complete slave to my addiction yeah. at that point. I, I actually started, that's when suicidal thoughts started creeping in. Okay. That was my complete rock bottom. When I started, I was still alone in my apartment mm -hmm. and I, I was addicted to all these different things. And I, I had the wherewithal to call my sister. And I said, I said, things have gotten so bad. I'm having suicidal thoughts. Um, I didn't admit the drugs, but I, I just told her, I go, if I could just get therapy and antidepressants, I know that that would, that that would set me straight. And I said, I, uh, and I don't want this therapist to ever tell me about Jesus, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I knew that wasn't where it's at. Right? Mm -hmm. But I, she was, like, sometimes when, an, when someone's desperate, like, it's not the right time to preach at him. It's just the time to be kind, yeah, you know? That's good. And that's what my sister was, she treated, she was, she was like Jesus to me at that moment. Wow. She, she washed my feet in a way, you know? And, um, and uh, she told me, come on back to Tulsa, I'll pay for therapy. I'll pay for antidepressants for you. I, we gotta help you. And uh, I went back there thinking it was just gonna be two weeks. I was like, this is just gonna be two weeks of therapy. And, um, it was after the third session with this therapist that I admitted that I was a current meth head. Hmm. And he said, he pretty much told me, well, if you're a meth head, we can't take care of this in two weeks. Right. You know? right. <laughs> this, he said, we're gonna need three, around three months. And um, that was just awful to hear because I knew how much money it was going to cost my sister and brother-in-law to pay for me to go to these yeah. therapy sessions and whatnot. So I did not want any part of it. I had a fight with my mom because she was like, I think you should take them up on it. And I said, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm going to do this my way. I will figure this out on my own. And that's when I, I, I took off, dry, I drove away by myself, sat in a parking lot and smoked weed and cried, you know, mm. because I knew that there was absolutely no hope for me. Wow. Right? And the, that, the crazy thing is, you, when times, what a blessing it was that I felt so helpless and had hit rock bottom at that exact moment because this, that's a lot of times that's exactly what God needs when your heart is, is that, yeah. is that vulnerable, yeah. you know? And I was, the stage, the stage was set, right? So I was, I was sitting in a, I was sitting in a stoplight. I remember, I'll never forget this. I was sitting in a stoplight and on the radio, I heard it was like top of the hour news and it was something about children being hurt or something like that. Hmm. 
out loud, I guessed to God, I guess this was a prayer. I said, I said, how the F could you let this happen? Yeah. And it, in retrospect, now that I have a bird's eye view of it, I wasn't just talking about that news story. I was, I was, I was angry at God. I was saying, how, your life. how could you let this happen mm-hmm. about me? How could, and I'm not saying that I used the F word. I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just saying, <laughs> this is a testament to where, that God will meet you wherever you're at. Yeah. You know? And the best I could do at that moment was say, how the F could you let this happen? Right? And with all of the anger, mm-hmm. I went to him with... I, I was presented with like an invitation. I was returned with love and acceptance and forgiveness. Mm. And that's when all of those things that had always weirded me out came back to me. Like, I, but I don't like church, but I don't like the Bible. I don't like praise and worship. And it was almost like it came back to me. Mm. If you'll put me first, I'm not worried about your little conditions. Wow. Right? I said, how could you let this happen? And it was, I, I'm not one to always say like, God told me this and God told me that, but I know, I know the Holy Spirit said to me that day <laughs> because I, I gave you your own free will. And it was like, you're chosen. You did, all, all, all of your own choices led you to where you're at right now. How about try my way? Yeah. And that was the day at the age of 43 when I accepted Jesus into my heart. Wow. <laughs> no. Man. Powerful. Powerful. Sitting there in a car, uh-huh. the lowest moment of your life, your heart was finally open. And number one, thank you for sharing that. I know that's not always easy. Um, let's talk about now recovery. Right. What, so what were some of the things that you had to do? Great. The Jesus moment happened. Uh, God met you in your darkest place. What was recovery like? Right. Well, as, as much as that felt at the time, like, like a finish line, really, it was the beginning the of a yeah. new life. It was a starting point. I, I suddenly felt the strong desire to tell people about this. Like I told all of my friends, I, I had an encounter with God, you know, and I got all reactions everywhere from, wow, that's cool to, I don't want to hear anything about that ever again. Um, but I just had to tell everybody. Another thing I had to do is I felt the strong desire to, for community. Like I joined not one or two, I joined three small groups because I wanted so bad to be around other believers so I could talk to them about the ways of God. Like I was so starving for this and uh, God put a real hunger in my, I started like binging on podcasts and of course going to church, but it was a true heart change yeah. and it took work. It took work. It didn't just happen. Well, and I love that. I mean, I love what he's saying. I hope we're hearing this, that community, it, it has to be a part of your life, that you're not created to do life alone. Right. So much of the isolation from your choices, you know, kind of pushed you into that direction and God's love. It really is that relentless. Um, it is not just for Isaac or me. It, it is for, for everybody. And community was a key piece of that. Right. So let's wrap up with this then. Um, I want to give you the final word. If how would you encourage a couple people in this room, those that are um, having a loved one who has addiction, mm-hmm. what would you say to them? And then what would you say to those of us that are battling addiction right now? And we're doing our best to mask it. We're doing our right. best to, you know, you know, go to work the next day, but we're afraid to let the light out. What would you say? Well, those, if, you're, if, if you have a family member or a friend who was like me right now, I mean, just know that, we serve a God that can, nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, consider the fact that like, consider the fact I was 43 years old when this happened. (laughs) Like I was, nobody thought, I mean, my friends that I grew up with, they, they were blown away that I had had a genuine encounter with God. It's never too late. It's never too late. I'm a product right now. I feel like I sit here right now because I'm a product of a family who never stopped praying for me right. and a God who never gave up on me. And if, if you're dealing with addiction, I mean, just know, know this. I know how you feel. I know that you feel like, like things are helpless and you are worthless, but try to understand because it is reality that you are more loved than you could possibly imagine. You, are, you really are by a God that wants, that wants to, will never stop trying to chase after you. There, I, I love this analogy that there's, <laughs> whenever you're trying to sell something, like a car or a house, like, I once heard somebody say that the, the true value of, of something is, is 
ultimately what someone will pay for it. Right. Right? And when you feel that way, just know, look to the cross and know that that's how much Jesus thinks you're worth it. So good, man. He died for you. Well, thank you for, um, man, sharing this part of your life and praying for you, continual recovery and just pouring back into us today. So you guys help me thank Isaac for being thank here. You yeah, appreciate you, man. It's great. So I want, I want you to think about something. Um, I was thinking about this as he was kind of talking. When, when your life is falling apart, where do you turn? Like, what's the first place that you go when life as you know begins to unravel? I'm just gonna take a shot in the dark. My guess is church, not only is not the first place, it might not even be in the top 10 places that you would turn to when life is falling apart. And maybe it's because like Isaac, you knew a lot about God, but you didn't know God. Maybe for you, church has always been a place, no, that's the place of judgment. That's the place of hypocrisy. I mean, when I go to church, I've got to act like I'm holding it all together. Maybe even today, before you got out of your car, you like threaten your kids. You're like, you better behave. And if your number gets paged on that screen, I'm gonna whip you. Like, so churches, it's all about just holding it all together. And we just sit down and we act like we're good and we don't feel like this could be a place where you can be authentic and real. And where do you go when life falls apart? It's interesting that we have created Big C Church like that for a lot of people. It's interesting when you consider that Jesus was very clear on why he came and for whom he came. See, in Luke chapter four, right before Jesus starts his three-year earthly ministry, he goes to the wilderness and he prays with the Father and he fasts. He comes out of the desert, literally out of the desert. And the first thing that he does before he recruits disciples, heals anybody, is he goes into the temple, the, the, the synagogue where religious um, learning took place, and he pulls out a scroll. And Jesus begins to read Isaiah Dr. Luke records it like this, Luke chapter four, verse 18. Here's what the scroll said. It said that the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to what? Proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Y'all, this is a bold movement in Jesus's ministry because basically what he's saying in the epicenter of religion, which a lot of it was corrupt, he is saying that I am the fulfillment of what Isaiah wrote about. It's in me and I'm here, let me be clear, to bring good news to the poor, to stand with the afflicted, to be there for those who are hurting. And I don't know where we've gotten away from that in church. I just want you to know as we go into our 18th year of ministry, that in this house, we stand with those that are hurting. We stand with the afflicted. It. We stand with people who don't have it all together, that this can be the place where you truly let it out and let God be the one that begins to restore you. This is the place of freedom. Isaiah and the scroll said, for this is the year of God's favor. Favor is blessing. And I believe that this is the year, 18th year of God's favor. But favor doesn't happen unless there's freedom and freedom in Christ won't happen unless you allow God to break you that freedom happens in the breaking. So today, I think this is a good opportunity to look inward and ask, my, ask me, what, what have I allowed to grip me? What part of my flesh is gripping me and robbing me of the identity that Christ calls and says over my life? So that's why today I'm excited to share with you as we go into this 18th year and beyond that we're really gonna be doubling down, that we want Life Point to be the first place that people look to go when life has fallen apart. So we've come up with this like mantra that we wanna be a place of hope for the hurting. And we got big plans to make sure that this isn't just a phrase, but this is something that we're actually doing. We're, we're gonna start dealing with mental health and counseling, but we just launched something two weeks ago uh, that's a part of hope for the hurting called Celebrate Recovery. We launched this two Fridays ago. It's a nationwide faith-based program, really based off of the Beatitudes, the teachings of Jesus. Celebrate Recovery is an incredible ministry. It's directly impacted my family personally, um, which is just absolutely incredible, where it's for people who are hurting, have habits, hangups. It's not just if you're physically addicting, or battling an addiction, maybe you have a family member who is. Maybe there's something in your past that you just can't get over, there's a hurt, or maybe you are addicted. This is a safe place that we've created. It's every Friday night. 
six to eight right here in this building. And so maybe for you, your next step, like Isaac talked about was community. And you need to be a part of Celebrate Recovery and start allowing light into those dark areas that are really robbing you of life. And so today on our way out, you're gonna notice um, that there are signups all over the place for Celebrate Recovery. You can go get more information, but also Life Group as well. Today's our official fall Life Group signup as we're kicking into our fall semester. And Life Groups are just simply small groups of adults. He called them a small group uh, that meet all around the greater Charlotte area. So there's days of the week, whatever night works for you, whatever you gotta do, I'm telling you this year, get in the community, experience hope and encouragement. You're not created to live life alone. So let's just stand to our feet. I'd love to just pray over you as we close our time out today. And if you're battling something, if there is an addiction that's gripping you, I hope you know that that same freedom and grace is right here for you today that can only be found in the person of Jesus. And don't leave this place. We'd love to talk with you afterwards, whatever we can do to provide hope in times of hurt. So God, we thank you so much for the clarity that you've given us. God, we know that this is messy. It would be so much cleaner to just come here and check a box and act like we're holding it together. But Lord, we wanna embrace the mess because in our messiest moments, you loved us and you dressed us and you put us together. God, we're grateful. So now we wanna love one another. God, we're we're grateful that your, your love for us never stops chasing us down. Even when we don't see you, you see us. So God, we hold on to that hope today. God, I pray for those that are stepping into community and life groups and celebrate recovery. God, that it will be so beneficial for their life. God, pour into us. We thank you. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming. We'll see you next week. Thanks, church.